Hello, folks. How's everybody doing today? We are here sending some great information out of Ventura County on behalf of the Ecolores Multicultural Program coming out here from Santa Paula, California. We have some very special guests today that we wanted to, to share with you that are going to be coming here in, on August 17th to Santa oh. Paula. And first and foremost, I want to introduce some of the folks from the De Colores uh, nonprofit. Uh, can we have a couple of folks from the De Colores nonprofit say a few words? Speak starting with Vanessa Costa. Hola, Julio. Hola, todos. Just wanted to share that we're having a wonderful event coming up at the Blanchard Library here in Santa Paula. And uh, we're going to have our guest, Naomi Quinones, poet from East Bay, and also Dr. Jose Cuellar, also known as Dr. Loco from the Jalapeno, was it the Jalapeno Band? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're going to have them featured at the Blanchard Library on Saturday, August the 17th from 11 to 2 p.m. They'll be there. The both will be in conversación and conversation, and there will be some refreshments and other activities. Wonderful, wonderful. We're really looking forward to this. But most and foremost, let's let's introduce our, our guests today, uh, Dr. Jose, a.k.a. Dr. Loco, and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Naomi Quiones. Are you there, both of you? Yes. Yes, we are. Wonderful. Well, starting with, with uh, Doña Quiñones. Doña Quiñones, tell us about how you are excited about coming to Ventura County and what you are bringing to this community. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I've been a big supporter of the De Colores events over the many years that it's been in existence. And um, I've actually been, uh, uh, I've read poetry at, at a number of them. It's a very important event that brings people together. And um, I'm always for uh, events and activities that bring the community, the grassroots community together in unison to you know, enjoy not only Nuestra Cultura, but the information that people have to impart. And in this particular event coming up on August the 17th, I'm gonna be in conversation with Jose Cuellar, um, whom I've known for many years, uh, probably um, he doesn't even realize how long I've known him because uh, he was at, uh, he was in Los Angeles when I was in Los Angeles, just kind of like coming up doing my thing and he was out and I, and I used to go to a lot, a lot of his, uh, his concerts. So um, the idea of a a poet and historian, which I am, in conversation with a musician and a musicologist I, is very exciting to me. I think it brings together the two genres uh, in a way that can help us understand um, not only our history, but our contributions to, uh, to culture uh, at, at this time. So I'm super excited about you know getting together with Jose and you know talking to him, asking him to um, uh, relate some of his uh, uh, his life uh, and his interests with me, and I'll try and interact as a poet who's had, even though we may be a generation or so away, we I think both come up and are galvanized by the Chicano and Chicana movement. I think that's yes. the really interesting to to see how that pans out and what i thought uh, well i spoke to both of you this weekend and it was really good conversations what i found both of you had in common was language and expression and mm -hmm. also like you said uh, coming from a chicana chicano point of view um tell us a little bit about your uh how you became a poet how you how you started having a voice we had mm -hmm. talked about uh, a little bit about how you started very young, expressing yourself and, and how you finally said, hey, you know what? I have a voice. <laughs> well, you said it pretty good right there. <laughs> but I started, uh, I like I tell people, I think I, just, I think I came with the gift of poetry into this lifetime because I'm writing at a very, as soon as I learned how to write, I was scribbling poetry. And I had my first poetry reading in the second grade when I wrote a yeah. poem and the teacher said, hey, you got to read this poem at our 
community school event. And so there I was in the, the second grade reading reading for the first time. So I wrote a di a, occasional poetry, birthdays, familia gatherings, Mother's Day. Uh, I wrote a Mother's Day poem and I went to uh, in the, I think it was in high school, and I accidentally left it. I went to go make copies of it and I accidentally left it in the copy machine. And I knew the person who um, had that little store. And I got a call later on in the day saying, hey, you left your poem in the copy machine. I go, okay. But other people have seen it and they would like to have copies of it for their moms. So I think that was kind of like the first um, you know, clue that poetry is something that people love and yes. they want to hear. And you know, I think any kind of expression from the heart and then I really got into it super deeper during the Chicano movement because yes. at the time we have this cultural movement, there's music, there's murals, there's poetry. And I, I came up um, really when I was at San Jose State as a, I went to, to uh, uh, college there. And that's when I started to work with other artistas, the teatros and so forth uh, to read poetry. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, Mr. Jose, Dr. Jose, a.k.a. Dr. Loco, we were speaking about um, the way that you use language, the way that you intertwine English and Spanish back and forth. And you had mentioned the word co code switching, which really stuck to me. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, that is just simply a concept that that uh, the first two going uh, back and forth between uh, different uh, codes uh, of all kinds, but language is one of those codes, Spanish and Mexica or uh, Spanish and uh, Cachiquel or English and Spanish or any of those when we begin to to go back and forth, and one of the things was that when I grew up in the, I, it was it as you as you were talking, I, I I was reminded, and I, I'm gonna have to write this up, <laughs> that <laughs> I was, uh, I had just turned four, and uh, my mom was pregnant with my my brother to be, he was gonna be born in June, and this was. April and my tia Silveria, who lived in in Dallas, and my tia Pete, uh, he was a, a tailor and a master flautist musical, uh, uh -huh. and uh, but she offered to take me to Dallas so my mom could concentrate on birthing my brother and just taking care of my sister and my brother, uh, and so she took me to Dallas. And then she realized she didn't want me hanging out with all the kids in the barrio. Yeah. And around. So she would sit me on the counter in the cleaners and have me memorize poetry and mm -hmm. then recite it back to her. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was really interesting because it, Naomi, my you know, I love poetry and reciting, but I never really thought of creating because from early on there was all this poetry that was presented to me in the way this word, you know, and I <laughs> interpreting, I liked it. so I I think, because, you know, I, I did it and it was all building up to that uh, 16 de September they had, she had booked me to do uh, to 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 present the El Grito de, de Hidalgo in, in Dallas at the, at the Fiesta Patras in, 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 in Dallas and Thanks. so I was about four and a half and <laughs> she, had me, she had me memorize the whole thing and I did it. And that's really impressive in, in two ways, I think, now that I think about it right now, thinking about how that really affected me, my really curiosity and interest in words and seeing how this this was done and also in performing. Yeah. Because when I performed and I had this reaction from all these people out there, I went, oh, mm -hmm. wow. And then when I came back to San Antonio, my mom put me into some Amateur shows, my tío Pete had made me a little traje de charro, and I was, you know, five, five and a half, knocking them out. 
yeah. <laughs> beating out the competition because I, I could memorize all these different poems, long poems, uh-huh. and then and then recite them. Uh, and so my first performance and my first with, with poetry was was that early. I I even had I think a little radio program like five ten minutes or so on KCOR radio in the in the late late forties uh, doing uh, children's poetry that I would that I would recite on the air. That's wonderful. That's wow. wonderful. And, you know, and also I the first uh, one to ever hear about this. I never told anybody this before. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> I'm happy to hear it because it it starts early. You know, I mean, I the advice to parents is to watch your kids and see what they do, you know, creatively and encourage it. To Jose, you got that encouragement. That's great. One of the things that they're also, I as I reflect now, it really helped me early on to develop memorization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm which is something that we really need as we go, the more and more as we go through life and the more and more the older we get. Yep. So, uh, yep. You know, and that's, you know, because that's one of the issues in aging. Yeah. Yep. The loss of memory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I think that's, a, that's, that's really something important to consider uh, as we move forward. Um, well, I was going to add... Um... There's a lot of, 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 there's been an ongoing movement in the Chicano movement to connect to our indigenous roots. And that keeps on going, moving forward until now. Whether we see that in, in the in the sweat lodges, we see that in the support that we're giving to the, uh, the peace and dignity runs that are happening right now across the Americas. Um, and um, we were, t- I was talking to, to Naomi about the uh, indigeneity and, and how that influences her poetry. Um, and also you, Dr. Loco, we'll, we'll talk to you after we talk to Naomi about the, the way that you put that into your music. But first, Naomi, can you tell us a little bit about the spirit, the spirituality in and in, 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 in how you connect to that in your poetry, please? Well, it took a while for that to happen for me because, you know, like I said, I was writing for occasions and, um, you know, life circumstances. I wrote a lot about the Chicano movement activities that were happening in Los Angeles, but it really wasn't until I started taking classes in college and learning about my indigenous past um, and present actually. Um, And also the danzantes that were coming up at that time, um, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, it it was very much a part of the how we started our rallies and our um, meetings was with, you know, prayer with Sage, with with Bancantes. And so that began to kind of come into my consciousness more, which uh, was about pride, you know, it was about taking pride in my, in, in, in this legacy. Because part of the Chicano movement, uh, it, it, it was the need for it was that we didn't feel proud. And yeah. um, we needed something to galvanize our sense of identity. So when I realized I had this, you know, thousands of years of a legacy um, uh, on, on my indigenous side, it, it just really compelled me to bring that into my poetry as well. And the very first poem that I wrote as more of an adult was called Anima. Starting with the fog in my mirror slowly unveils a woman of bronze, earth, and fire. And I go into this journey of an, an indigenous woman throughout, you know, the years and what, what happens to her. And that was one of my first, you know, big poems. My second poem was Chile Jalapeno Night, <laughs> nice. which, you know, the idea of, uh, of, of, of food, of, of how this one, this one ancient food could uh, open my senses and my world and relate me to my family and my yeah. family um, uh, culture. So yeah, it was very organic how that came to me. But I have to say, had it not been for what I was learning in the Chicano studies at that time, uh, I think it would have been a little longer for me or more difficult for me to connect with that. 
And, and I, uh, that please oh, go ahead, Jose. I just wanted to to mention that that I'm totally free associating with your chili jalapeno recipe uh, <laughs> reference because there's a guy that I uh, that I knew as he as he was growing up. We were undergraduates at Cal State Long Beach together, and then I went off and he went off, and later on uh, I found out he's the uh, now, uh, prof- well, he's emeritus now, Professor Emeritus of Ethnic Studies at uh, San Luis Obispo, Cal State San Luis Obispo. And he's written a number of really impressive books. And one of his recipes from memory. And the other study that when I was at Harvard doing my research on the Ocarinas, he was at Harvard doing his research on Chiles. And he has a, a new uh, book coming out regarding, again, memory, Chile, culture, intergenerational, uh, really interesting uh, takes on, 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 on the cultura, on the food. And uh, so, you know, just mentioning mention that Victor Valle and recipes, I think, from memory, and another one to be out on Chile's. Just look right. him up. He's a Cal State, Luis Obispo, San Luis Obispo, and you know, I think, Jose, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you, um, can you speak? I mean, well, something that I had gotten a word from from some of the professors over at Cal State Channel Islands University over here. Um, they had mentioned that uh, you started uh, working with uh, pre-Columbian instruments. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how that experience has been? Yes. Uh, first of all, I you know I have to I have to do a disclaimer saying that, you know, I came to academia to do Chicano studies. Yeah. I was, uh, when I was recruited to UCLA, uh, along with other colegas there, I was a veteran. The Terano, I done my BA on my GI Bill, and I got uh, fellowships to do my, my doctorate, my master's and my doctorate. But I wanted to do Chicano studies, Chicano issues, Chicano concerns. And to me, Mesoamerica was too far in many ways from the Chicano, contemporary Chicano experience. And I thought it was a distraction at that time from contemporary issues, gang warfare, the Vietnam War, all of those issues, civil, you know, uh, equal rights, all of the things we were, we were dealing with. It just seemed like, wow, man, you know, that really is a distraction. So when I go to UCLA, first thing I do I have to put that aside. I wanted to go to New Mexico to do my Chicano studies. They insist, and in fact, you know, kind of say I'm going to lose my fellowship if I don't go to Guatemala. Yeah. So I do my master's research in Guatemala. I come back and say, okay, cool, that's it, man. I write up my master's research. I go to, I apply for a job at Cal State. I, I mean, at, at the Claremont Colleges. They they really like me. They say, great, man, uh, we only have one request. Uh, you can teach whatever you like, but we, we need to teach ancient civilizations of Aslan. Said, oh, man, I don't do Aztecs. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's what we really need. We'll have to get somebody else. That's yeah. okay, I will. So I did. And we put together a good piece. It was eventually the, the first uh, program in a, Series a TV series that was the first Chicano documentary series uh, by Frank Cruz on NBC. There, I think there, there's you working with the archives. You can find a copy of this. I know that it's on the internet, uh, 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 and it's called Chicano, and it's a, yeah. a number of us from East L- from, from UCLA that uh, that covered uh, Richard uh, Romo covering East LA, different different thing, uh, Albert Camarillo, etc. So. I, is that the one produced my by point is, my yeah. point is I didn't really ever want to be, but I always would get, and the same thing happened with Carrasco. Mm. David Carrasco, when we met in Colorado, the next year after I leave Colorado, he's connected with the Templo Mayor. And so he calls me and says, hey, they want to talk to you. So we connect with Mato Moctezuma and, and Alfredo Lopez Austin. Uh, and and the workers there, and we really begin to, but I'm still kind of saying, well, you know, I do Chicano studies. I'm, I'm here. I'll support you. 
yeah. I'm doing several studies because I couldn't find a way to could really connect it. But after I met oh. my real things came with, with when I was at Stanford uh, doing my visiting, you know, the worst nightmare. I was a visitor, invited me for one year, and I stayed for five. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I went, and Andres Segura came through Stanford. Yeah. And uh, I listened to him, and I just, I had never heard anything like it. And so that altered things for me, and I began to focus more and more in the personal level, not in the kind of pol academic level. You know, yeah. so I started playing flutes in 87, uh, the Native, North, Native, North Native American flutes, and I was already had, had been some connections with, with those cultures. And then my homeboy from San Antonio, Texas, another great poet, Raul, que paz descanse, Raul Salinas, mm. was really engaged with the North, with the American Indian movement. Yeah. Uh, and so he was really influential in my thinking as well. He did a, a, a collection called Amor Indio. Uh, and so that, you know, so little by little, it evolved. And then when they made me this offer at Harvard to do the, they, the, they gave me a scholarship called the North American, the Herding mm -hmm. North American Territorial for North American Ethnology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it would be really good if you don't call me a musical a musicologist, yeah. Because people have degrees in that, and they resent those of us that don't have a musicology degree. Orale. <laughs> musicology. <laughs> so I'm an ethnologist yeah. and a musician, or a musician and an ethnologist, but not a musicologist. <laughs> there you go. There you uh, go. Anyway, well, so, yeah. Go ahead. So, so at Harvard. Even though I wanted, again, I wanted to do North America, and they said, no, you can't because they're all been contaminated with pesticides, and so uh, you have to do Central American ceramics if you want to do them. I said, okay, I'll do them. And then finally, I opened up myself to learning, hmm. and it's uh, been extraordinary, had an extraordinary impact on my life and hmm. on my understanding of Mesoamerica. Yeah. Uh, these are... Yeah. These flutes are really a key to Mesoamerica that no one had ever seen before. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I, I love the fact that both of you have a big passion for Chicanismo, Chicano studies, Chicana studies. Um, Naomi, you are also a professor of Chicana, Chicano studies, women's studies. Tell us the importance of, of teaching these kind of uh, classes and, and, you know, even to now, like connecting the, the past the present and the future. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your journey and, and your, your passion to teach? Right. Well, um, it seems like, you know, for me, the impetus to um, to get my PhD was to be able to, to teach about our, um, our experiences, our contributions, our cultura, and especially those of La Mujer. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that as in the larger society, specifically in the um, Mexican culture, women are often marginalized and we don't have the history of their background. My dissertation is called Hijas de la Malinche, yeah. um, Social Agency of um, Chicana Women Writers. And in that, I was able to really um, delve into all of the aspects from ancient times, you know, the role that um, that the women had as Mayas, as Aztecas, as indigenous women, uh, all the way through the immigration period to the United States, um, and then on through the Chicano movement, and then how women then become um, Chicana women or women of Mexican origin. Uh, you know, they become professionals, they become artists, um, they, they have now this, this impetus. So I, I really enjoyed filling in the silence with um, uh, information and with the voice of the women, and also yes. on a historical level to fill in the blanks of um, what women have contributed and what their experiences have been. So a lot of my poetry does uh, focus in on uh, women, and also spirituality, because I think that this is where a lot of our spirituality comes from. You know, uh, 
uh, were raised by by women, and so our uh, information about spirituality comes from that. Whether I don't want to say it's totally Catholic, because I think maybe all of you will agree that we're really um, synchronistic in that we oh, don't we don't do Catholicism in the same way other people do Catholicism. We have the Virgen de Guadalupe, which is mainly uh, an, indi an indigenous um, uh, Maria, Mary, and uh, her power in Mexico and actually throughout Latin America as well as here in LA, is super strong. So, you know, it's kind of, we, we have indigenized a lot of our quote unquote Catholicism and, you know, I wanted to explore that as well. I think just in general, um, having any information um, about us as women, as men, our history, really helps us in, to, um, to feel gr more grounded in our identity. And I, a very sad and I think possibly a tragic thing is that um, uh, young people are not getting that information unless they go to college. So yeah. the experience I had teaching, saying everything from an introduction to Chicano studies or Chicana studies to something more specific, the student reaction would be, how come we didn't get this information? How come we don't know this information? Where, you know, can I get more information? And it, that yeah. really spoke to the fact that we have a... Um, we have this this empty space sometimes with uh, regarding our identity, and um, you know, feeling pride in oneself is really important. Uh, you know, which is really um, a major problem with a lot of young people is that they don't know how to have pride in themselves, um, and they go off into to other directions. Uh, so that time of the, of the early Chicano movement was so important in helping and inspiring people like me to get my degree in, in something where I could be able to share this information and uh, fill in those blanks and those silences. Great. Well, um, I I'm going to take... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. So I just want to remind everybody, all our listeners, that uh, we're going to have Naomi and Dr. Jose Cuellar. We're going to have both Dr. Naomi Quinones and Dr. Jose Cuellar at the Blanchard Library on Saturday, August the 17th. And the Blanchard Library is located at 119 North 8th Street in Santa Paula. And let me give you the number so you have your, you can connect with them, 805 525-3615. That's 805-525-3615. And I wanted to ask Naomi one more uh, question, if you don't mind. Um, of course. Uh, I wanted to ask her, um, in connection that most of the women who don't go to college, I know that in certain communities, there are a gathering of women, like for instance, the women of the corn. Can you give us a little bit, a little history on that? I know that that brings a lot of the young women together so they are connected with their roots? Right, yeah. I, mean, I don't know a lot about the uh, Mujeres de Maiz that took that uh, pretty much came up in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but it is definitely informed by, um, by women, whether or not they have a college education or not, wanting to connect to their roots because that feels more real to them than this highly materialized capitalistic society that places not only women, but in people in certain roles that are very restrictive. So for instance, you know, it's not in Mujeres de Maiz is one organization, but they're all over the Southwest, wherever there are Chicanas, we're coming together again uh, in the spirit of our uh, indigenous belief system. I also, as you know, um, have brought together a moon ceremony, a new moon ceremony for women of, of color. And um, where we talk a lot about the moon phases and, and the moon representing the, the feminine, the sacred feminine and, you know, and, and the woman uh, compared to the, um, the sun, which represents more of the, the masculine energy. 
And so under the new moon, we come together and we perform ceremony and we talk and speak from our hearts. Uh, we listen to each other and, you know, we help each other navigate these very troubled times, you know, that, that we're born right now as grandmothers, as moms, you know, as, as single women who are on their path, uh, as, as Diaz, um, as organizers and, and, and professionals, we are, we're helping each other navigate. So I think it is a catalyst in the indigenous belief system becomes a catalyst for our gathering together and really strengthening our idea of what it is to be um, uh, not just a woman, but involved with our sacred feminine, which everybody including men have the sacred feminine within them. Yes. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. no, definitely. We got to keep plugging in August 17th um, at the which library? Blanchard Library located at 119 North 8th Street in Santa Paula. And the number again is 805-525-3615. And um, is there a cost for this or is free uh, event. free events? Um, event. But be being funded by... The Colores Friends, the Friends of the Colores, it's um, it's a free event. We will have some refreshments and be able to, we'll, we'll, it's a family event and we want um, all generations to, to come and participate and listen. And yes, you, you, you and Lencho were just speaking about intergenerational events and bringing all of the familias together.